meaning of that word. I know. It belongs in the dictionary. A, a historic moment. Yeah, could you we'll say that word again? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, thank you to everyone who's viewing the recording of this meeting. Um, all, all the thousands of you out there. I was just thanking everyone for being so punctual and starting, <laughs> kicking, kicking 2023 off with a lot of enthusiasm. Um, right. <clears throat> so it looks like I will go ahead and call us to order because I see everybody's name on my screen and almost <clears throat> everybody's face. So it's nice to see you all and let's get started. So, um, so we go to the, uh, the next slide. Oh, sorry. No problem. No. Okay. We, we did roll call. We did roll call. Um, does anybody have any comments about the agenda or would anyone, would anyone like to motion to approve it? I'll make a motion to approve it. Second. Richard. Thank you, Tom. <coughs> John? Aye. Kira? Aye. Jacob? Oh, I think Jacob, I'm having trouble with your sound. Yeah. Yeah, your mic's not working, but I saw his mouth move. Yeah, I can I can see that you unmuted. <laughs> I did too. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Okay, we got a we've got a visual eye, I believe. <laughs> Jacob. Richard. Aye. Tom. Aye. And, um, wait, did I get Michelle? Michelle? Aye for me. Okay, and I am an eye as well. And I will just note on the materials, I apparently had sent out the um, not quite finished file on the um, item 6B. So I sent that mm -hmm. about an hour ago. So right. um, the information isn't different, but the way it's presented is. So um, just wanted to alert you to that fact. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, hopefully everybody had a chance to look that over. And thank you, John and Richard, for putting that together. I think it's really well done. <clears throat> okay, um, any announcements from staff, Harry? No, I don't think so. Nothing new. Cool. Um, any commissioners have announcements or pieces that you forward to everyone that you would like to highlight? Okay, uh, you did you did receive some materials from both Rochelle, Michelle and Richard. So mm -hmm. yeah, just uh, just a quick summary of the, uh, because it's two packets I sent, which one is uh, sending you know a monthly monthly news items that I come across while I'm doing my work um, on uh, climate change issues. And there was I uh, there was something about plastics, I think, in this last packet, if I remember right, that I sent around, um, and uh, toxics, uh, levels of toxics and things like that. I think that's actually raises a question about, we may have to reevaluate our recycling policies. Um, oh. uh, because Davis takes just about everything, and it may not be worthwhile to do that. Um, the other thing that I sent around was there a whole bunch of news articles about uh, natural gas stoves and indoor air quality, um, yeah, which you might right. want to read. And so <laughs> I tried to pick up a range of, of viewpoints on the, on that that I came across. Um, and uh, interesting reading it. Uh, it's looking also, I think Michelle sent around um, the uh, Bay Area AQMD's proposal to uh, phase out um, gas furnaces and water heaters in their rules. Um, so <clears> that <throat> could be a, something that we're maybe looking at as well up here. If I could add on to that, um, if you want the, the 10 minute introduction to this issue, PBS NewsHour did a, a story this week and it's available on YouTube. So if you do a search on PBS NewsHour and gas stoves, you'll find a nice piece. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, I feel like I've been noticing generally more media attention to gas stoves 
recently and kind of raising public awareness. So it'll be interesting to see if that influences the public kind of reception to those measures and the cap moving forward now that it's kind of becoming more of a mainstream topic of discussion. Are there any other announcements? And Jim, do you have any announcements? I see you have joined us as well, so welcome. No, I'm just here for the uh, cap update. Awesome. Okay, sounds good. I think with that, we can go to public comment. Let's see if anybody's here. We have two attendees. Um, so if either of you would like to make a public comment, please feel free to raise your hand. All right, not seeing any public comment. You can go to the consent calendar, um, which is just approving our minutes from November. Does anybody have any comments or changes they wanted to make to the November minutes? Yeah, one thing I think should be noted is that um, that Meg and I prepared a um, draft introductory letter. I don't, I don't remember seeing that in the minutes. I, I honestly read them somewhat quickly, but uh, that probably should be included in the minutes. The it doesn't mention that the two of you did it, but it says that um, since the letter was not required before going to city council, that you would discuss <laughs> it at a later meeting. Yeah, right. And I just wanted to note that we actually did come to the meeting with a draft letter. Okay. I will so add that, that. So that they know that we actually worked on it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Any other comments? Would anybody, uh, yeah, go uh, ahead, Richard. I was just gonna make a motion to approve the minutes, et cetera. Thank you. I, I'd I'll, make that motion. All right, sounds good. John? Abstain. Kira? Aye. Richard? Aye. Jacob? Aye. Michelle? I, Tom. I, and I am an I as well. And just as a point of order, John, I know you know this, but you do not have to have been at the meeting to vote. You do not have to abstain if you were absent. Uh, I do know that. However, I usually take the approval at the following meeting as a recognition that the minutes properly convey what happened at the meeting. So that's how I usually think of it. Right. The only time it really comes up as being important is if there isn't a quorum of people that were at the previous meeting, um, and then people do not have to have been there to approve the minutes. All you're saying officially is that you've read them, but I know that you knew that already. I was just pointing that out. Uh, one, yeah, go ahead, Carrie. one other minor point, um, I have been trying to see participants and every time I try to find the list of participants, I advance the screen. So you can just keep me up to date on whether anybody has their hand raised, Meg. Okay, any public comment on the CAP update? Oh, wait, this should not that we should be on 6-8, oh, sorry, it already okay. been, yeah. So um, the CAP update is actually um, a fairly brief item that was um, given to you in the staff report. Um, as of the last meeting at the end of November, you had not seen the final draft CAP in its um, published form, which you now have seen. Um, and that was taken to city council along with Every comment people in the community made, um, a summary in the staff report of responses to those comments, all of the NRC um, comments and responses to those um, and um, other items, all of that was taken to council on December 6th. 
and um, following review of presentation and review of it, city council made a motion to um, complete the, the final cap and complete the environmental review and to make certain changes to the cap. Um, the first was to change the building electrification for existing buildings to voluntary only. Um, no ordinance to be developed um, in the coming three years at least, and then um, assess that data um, to incorporate the Valley Clean Energy procurement um, acceleration of renewables, um, to provide more information on transportation demand management, and to um, look into assessing the existing building stock to see readiness for electrification. So that's what staff is working on now because um, those <laughs> changes do have some potentially um, significant impacts on, on the CAP document and the um, environmental review. Staff put a hold on completing both of those while we determine next steps. Um, before we before we start making changes. And the main thing is that um, the Valley Clean Energy um, data on procurement does not change the 2030 target because that was already incorporated. We don't look at them incrementally 2024, 2025, 2026. It was um, assessed based on the 2030 numbers, which were already 100% renewable. So that doesn't change anything, but changing the, um, the electrification to fully voluntary for the foreseeable future does potentially have some significant impacts, both on um, streamlining for CEQA and on the target achievement. So we're we're analyzing and assessing that now. And that's really the only update. Um, I hope you've all had a chance to take a look at the final document. Um, I think most of you have, and many of you were at the city council meeting, but we haven't discussed it as a group because we haven't had a meeting since then. So that's it for the CAP staff report. No action requested at this time. Okay, thanks, Carrie. Uh, let's open it to public comment and then I'll go through and ask for follow-up questions. So if anyone would like to make a public comment on the CAP, please raise your hand or press star nine if you're joining by the phone. It doesn't look like we have any public comment. Uh, Trisha has her hand up. Yeah, so I'll go to Trisha and then Jim next. Do either of you have any questions or comments for Carrie? Um, Jim, I have you. I see you have your hand up. Do you want to start? Yeah, just I just have a, a brief comment. Uh, a lot of the uh, controversy and so on seems to be about building electrification. I just wanted to remind everybody of uh, how these last two weeks of storms have affected our effort at expanding the urban forest and the uh, complicated interaction between how climate change affects trees and then how trees affect climate change. So uh, th there's, a, there's a major challenge there and I don't think I need to say any more about it. Everybody knows that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. I think it is important to keep to keep those very in essential but kind of less discussed topics as part of the conversation. Um, and because yeah, the climate plan is not exclusively building electrification, although that's mostly what we've talked about. Trisha, do you have any comments or questions? All right, I think I will take that as a no for now, but Trisha, if you want to add, chime in at any point, feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, and so now ask commissioners. Tom, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, no. Okay, Kira? Um, not at this time, thank you. John? Uh, I had two, and I, uh, I'll ask them now because they might help us in the next item. Um, Carrie, is there any connection between meeting our 2030 target and whether or not um, uh, the cap can be covered under a 
negative declaration? No. All right, that was easy. Uh, this And the second question was, um, in the staff report, give me just a second here. In the staff report, oh, I've lost it. Uh, um, the interpretation of the city council's motion, I just want to get a clarification on it, says that the, um, the language regarding building electrification shall focus for the first three years on the on a robust voluntary approach. So I guess my my question was about what first three years mean. We know that there wasn't going to be anything. Um, the implementation roadmap had a couple of years of developing materials in it. Does the first does the three years start after that, or is the first three years starting now? Um. The way that it was presented by Dan Carson, who made the motion, was that no um, consideration of an ordinance or um, requirements for electrification until after 2026. He didn't say which month of 2026. So um, that would be three years from now, at yeah. the very least, January 2026. There was a bit of confusion in the cap in that Originally, we talked about developing the ordinance in 2025, which is when we develop reach codes is the year before the reach code goes into effect, which the state reach code, the state energy code goes into effect on the 1st of January of every year. Um, so 2025 would be as you would be developing it and approving it by council, and then it would go into impact into effect on January 1st. So there was kind of some interchange of 2025 and 2026. Um, the, the motion as recorded was from the city clerk. So um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Kind of, it, it, um, it, it seemed like you said, we, we have a couple of years to develop the next step of the breach code. And, and then I was, I was I was concerned that his motion would be that our reach code to have to be voluntary for three years after that, which would take it up to like 2028 or so. Um, no, we're not. Yeah, we're not really talking about the reach code here. We're talking about developing an ordinance for electrification. Sorry. It the, no, it's OK. I, I made things confusing. It was the cap that sort of tied the electrification and the reach code because of the convenience of the timing, but this particular action does not mention the reach code. There is another action to keep updating the reach code as it comes along. I think that's like four, BE four or five, BE four. I think is about the reach code, which is which is somewhat separate. So, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And did you have any another question? That was the second one. That was two. Oh, okay. Um, Richard? Uh, no, I think John got it. I do have to say that the, the council motion was quite ambiguous. Um, and the council member who made it is no longer on the council. So uh, um, we, we are in some ways going off of what we make of it. Um, well, we 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 wanted to make sure we had the correct language, so we asked the city clerk to provide it. That is what she provided. The only reason it was ambiguous is that part of the motion was during discussion, and then finalizing the motion was kind of like, yeah, that. And so, um, right, the, and yeah. then <laughs> vote was also confusing because the mayor at the time, Lucas Frerich, said you know, all in favor, I, and then he said, any opposed, no. And I thought that was no, there's no opposition, but it actually was, he was opposing the motion. So the vote was 4-1. So 4-1. Oh, that's oh. right, it was 4-1, it was 4-1, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, the cap, uh, Josh J Chapman did not abstain from the cap. That was a, that was a different item. No, I was, anyway. I was forgetting Lucas was still on the council. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, they're down so, so anyway, I, I think that the motion is now pretty much set in stone. And I think we understand the meaning of the three years is anytime after 2026. 
And of the various potential ways to respond to it, one is to have a cap that does not meet our 2030 target, which there is no rule that says you can't do that. So um, that is one potential approach. Um, um, and we've looked into, are there impacts of that? And right now, there's no grant funding impact that we've been able to determine. There's no, you know, like state hammer coming down saying you didn't reach your established 2030 target. Um, so we just have to decide, you know, internally what the response to this is going to be. And the reality is, if that's the way we're approaching it, we very possibly won't meet our targets and that's the reality but we are intending to do an update in the next two to three years so that can be reassessed after we do the data assessment so the biggest impact so far has been the delay because we put everything on hold we were going to release the negative declaration in december for public review but we didn't want to do that until we have this resolved so it's just it's another little blip another little delay but um you know, I think um, I think nothing. That's it. <laughs> uh, Jacob. Well, I'm sure you have some thoughts, Carrie. But thank you for that. Um, I think uh, my thoughts here are just that uh, we did hear a lot from um, commenters at the city council meeting about how this the appliance electrification was such a small portion of the overall picture and such a small portion of the uh, potential reductions. But I think we're also seeing in the um, process that you're speaking to, Carrie, that it does have a large impact. And we are so close to that 2030 goal that it, it can put us over the edge one way or another. Um, it's sort of a shame to think of a cap that, you know, the cap as structured now has an aspirational goal, as well as a minimum target. And to miss both of those targets for the more achievable 2030 goal is, is certainly a shame. But if that's um, you know, it, it's, it's the result of a, of a messy public process and it's, it's good to have people involved in it. And, and if that's, um, you know, the rest of the, the measures will still do some good and, and, um, looking forward to talking about those electrification ones a little bit more in the next item. Mm -hmm. Richard, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to note also, um, actually the public commenters outnumber supporting uh the existing proposal for the building electrification at the time gr greatly outnumbered the number of commenters who were uh, uh asking for a modification so um it was it was actually it was the people asking for modification were entirely realtors every single one of them mm -hmm. so, well, really? just, as a, just as a point on that, I agree with you, Richard, and I sent those numbers out to all of you after the meeting, as far as how many people spoke in person and via call-in and via emails in support or not in advance, but that doesn't mean that that's all that the um, council members heard. So we don't know what communications were directed at them one-to-one. -one. So well, Actually, my understanding is the email count emails that were sent to them also were heavily in favor of keeping the measure as it was the emails that went to the city council email but that what i'm saying is that doesn't mean that dan carson didn't personally get you know many many calls or we don't we don't know what the council members heard themselves and it's not really significant this is this is they can make their decision based on their expertise and what they what they want to do so um uh trying to make it clear that there wasn't some universal outcry for uh no, there was modifying not. it that. was it was oh, you are right that it was overwhelmingly um it was like two thirds of the comments were in support of the action as it was stated and the other number, probably less than a third, were were against it. Um, just to to Jacob's point, I think um, since we had not gotten any heads up about this potential um, change to the action, we had not um, focused on that in the presentation. So um, 
we could have provided more information about why 7% of the GHG reduction through building energy is such a significant number. And I really want to commend John and Richard for their, um, their report that they put together, because I think that in retrospect, now that they prepared that, that is what we should have provided at the time. But going into the meeting, we didn't we thought that we had resolved this issue um, and we had not gotten any input from realtors about this particular um, concern. They were mostly concerned about at point of sale, but that's all, you know, in hindsight. And um, I think Jacob's comment about public process is also very important because many people may not have spoken up, but felt strongly one way or another. So um Thanks for letting me expound on that a little bit. I think um, I think hopefully we'll still be taking the um, the cap to council in the first quarter, assuming we can answer these questions. Michelle, do you have any questions or comments? No, thank you. Okay, cool. I think one question I have is about the the follow-up assess, which I know Richard and John also kind of expanded on in their recommendation, but how, if there's a way for the follow-up assessment and then considering other measures from that point to be factored in to the weather, to meeting the greenhouse gas emissions reductions target. Um, for example, if the voluntary uptake is slower and then that means that there's a measure having kind of a more of an aggressive requirement. If that, if there's a way to use that kind of as a as a backstop to make sure the city's meeting the 2030 target. Well, can we talk about that in the next round, next yeah. item? <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe that's a good segue to to item 60. Yeah, and just as far as the measurements. Um, as per the spreadsheet that was prepared by AECOM for GHG reduction potential with a um, an ordinance, the assumption was that about 90% compliance with um, doing electrification of appliances uh, at time of permit was appropriate considering Davis's um, track record of having people come for permits and, and following the requirements of those permits. Whereas the um, number for compliance with the voluntary system is drastically lower. And mm -hmm. we have to use appropriate um, numbers that can be supported. So that's mm -hmm. why it makes such a big difference because, but in, in response to your, um, your comment, Meg, I think that if after one to two years, we see that voluntary compliance is higher than the numbers we can support theoretically for compliance, then, then we would know that. And if they're not higher, if they're down in the you know 10% or lower, um, as we're looking at now, then we would know that the only way to make this change in Davis would be to do some kind of ordinance. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, go ahead, John. So, Carrie, do you happen to know or have you calculated what compliance under a voluntary program, what compliance um, rate is needed in order to just meet the target? Because with 90%, we're a little bit over. So I guess we can go less than 90%. Well, we're talking very rough calculations at this point, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and so I wouldn't stand behind them, but we're talking like if we could get 50 to 60 percent compliance, okay. we would probably be within that that target area. So right. it's a it's a heavy lift mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. get that much from from 10 percent. So, you know, the kinds of things that we may want to look at as a, at a city, if this becomes an important component is where do we find funding to help incentivize people to make that change? And how do we do um, demonstrations and outreach for how those um, electric appliances would work compared to um, the gas ones? There's a number of things that can be done, but um, again, all of those 
percentages that I'm quoting are rough estimates at this point. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think, Don, that's a good question. I, and I think it would be helpful to be able to present a minimum compliance number, which probably we'll get into when we talk about Richard and John's letter. But I think calculating it that way and kind of being able to say this is the break even and if there isn't this compliance requirement, then it should be mandatory instead of kind of making I don't know, it, it could be kind of a more straightforward response compared to making assumptions about what the voluntary uptake will be. Okay, I think um, any final comments from anyone before we move on to the John and Richard's recommendations? Okay, probably not. So yeah, John and Richard, the floor is yours if you wanna kind of walk us through your letter and then we can discuss it. Uh, Richard and I didn't didn't uh, plan this. Did you want to go first? Or you want me to go first, Richard? Why don't you go first, John? Because you ended up polishing it up. So I think. All right. I'll, I'll try to also boil it down a little bit um, because uh, um, you because people have seen it and and we're already kind of talking about the issues. The point we made was that that we're, as Jacob said, we're not meeting our minimum target, and it seems a real shame not to do that. When we put the, put this together, and, and Richard started this, and I, I built on it, um, we actually had thought that the three year period would be after some kind of a program started, which is what I alluded to earlier, that it would go out further than than Carrie is telling us that it really is going to go. But we were concerned that that the um, that we've missed the target, and seem, seemingly unnecessarily, as Richard pointed out, that there's a lot of houses in town that are already set up to be able to easily uh, accommodate electrification. I mean, they have a big enough. The main issue is this panel. They have a big enough electrical panel, and for them, the switchover is is very simple. Whereas for others, many others, uh, my house included, I have a smaller panel. It's more expensive, more complicated, um, more time consuming because of PG&E's lack of capacity. And so that there's a real issue, a difficulty with um, um, electrifying houses with those smaller panels. And smaller panels are also the older houses, as I point out in the memo, that the older houses, which are liable to be in the um, perhaps less affluent parts of town. So Richard's proposal was that, that since we heard uh, public comment was always about cost and delay, which are not associated with the 200 amp panels, why don't we move forward and make the 200 amp um, panels mandatory and leave the others as voluntary. And in that way, we would get recapture some of that lost um, compliance um, and get ourselves closer to the target without, a, um, what is a, um, putting an, an excessive burden on folks who are uh, involved in this switchover at their house. So I think the, what we're looking for is a recommendation from the, the NRC back to city council, asking them to reconsider a part of what they uh, recommended to city staff. I don't think in that conversation, they were realizing that by making this change, they were, they were going to um, miss their targets. And I think that might've had an influence on their thinking had, had uh, we been able to point that out at the time. I think that's the guts of it, Richard. Do you want to add something? Um, yeah, I think that the, there's, uh, first off, the what people brought forward with their difficulties with trying to electrify was important and something that we really hadn't heard in our public process up to that point. But it really was apparent to me that it was this problem with the inadequate facilities and it 
and I had realized that there were actually a number of houses. It may be as much as half of the houses in Davis and maybe more actually have 200 amp panels um, after the uh, building boom that began in the late 80s. And Alan Pryor actually, uh, many of you remember Alan from the NRC before, uh, he's electrified his house with a 125 amp uh, panel. So we know it's feasible down to, to even a, a tighter panel than the standard 200 amp that's been built. And But that information wasn't brought before the council at all. There was no real discussion about that because we didn't really talk about it here. So it it seems like what we should be doing is is acknowledging this issue that the public has brought and being and parsing out this part of the cap into um, I see it actually as three different parts. One of them being those who have 200 amp panels. So that's basically all the new developments. I have a 200 amp panel actually on my 1956 house that they installed like 50 years ago. Um, so there are a number of houses that have these uh, in other places as well. Um, but also uh, it turns out houses with central air conditioning can just do a direct swap for a heat pump. And that's something that we hadn't really talked about do we want to do something that breaks it out? And the heat pump, that actually is the single biggest source of GHG emissions uh, in a household is the heating from um, from natural gas. Mm -hmm. So so those uh, we can move, we should try to move forward with as expeditiously as possible. And then we can focus on how do we electrify the more much more difficult uh, houses, the houses with 100 amp panels with inadequate uh, transformer capacity, or even older panels. Some houses even have 50 amp panels uh, in some of the older parts of town. So, and figure out how to finance those panels. But that makes the problem much, much more manageable to have a much smaller cohort that we are addressing. And we can get, we might even be able to get like three quarters of our uh, mission reductions that we were planning on by focusing this program in that way. My other concern is that if we have a program that's voluntary or has an extended deadline, that there will be a land rush for gas furnaces early on. Um, and there is a particular contractor in town who does a lot of uh, HVAC installations who in particular really dislikes the idea of installing heat pumps. And they are, I'm particularly concerned about them taking advantage of a delayed program. Um, so uh, that I would um, like to see us trying to figure out how to move as much of this forward as quickly as we can. Um, I think also the change in the city council is going to be make the, them more receptive, perhaps, to this issue uh, and a further discussion of it, especially if we can provide them more information than uh, what uh, than what anybody had prepared uh, going into this. I mean, we just didn't see this coming, any of us, until at the last minute. So um i think that we can come up with a much more um a better developed program that uh will um be much more likely to succeed so that's that's my thoughts and that's why i wrote this out um uh in response we should clarify a little bit uh the the uh and correct me if i'm wrong about this richard the document um that you received in the packet, uh, which is rather technical and sounds almost like a the start of an ordinance, um, was the initial attempt to address this issue, but that that, and that we'd like to submit that as as input to staff when considering this issue, but we're not asking NRC to look at that document and adopt it in whole or even. Yeah, in parts. We're looking for more of a, a recommendation of a sense of the NRC recommendation back to city council on this issue. Right. And and we we crafted a shorter memo. Um, and I can't for some reason I can't find the version that you sent around. Um Carrie but, sent it around just before the meeting. Okay. I I might not have seen I haven't seen that actually. 
I'm not sure I got it. It was just before the meeting. Okay. I, yeah, I'm looking at my emails right now, and I'm not seeing it in here. So it was as a it was a reply to the other emails. So she, we had three emails, and one had the agenda items, and then the second said panelist invitations had been sent out, and the third had the updated document. Yeah, I'll have to look to see because I just uh, as I was looking at the the original one that was sent, the longer five, one. Five twenty nine this afternoon. Yeah, I'm just not seeing it in my inbox. I'm not sure where it, it is. I don't know if it got caught in my spam or anything, mm. but I'm not seeing it. Okay, so let's move on. Do you want me to share that on the screen? You know what it is, Richard. You helped. Yeah. You created it. So did anyone else not receive it? Okay. So, okay, sounds good. Also, I saw Stephen had joined us. Welcome, Stephen. And before we move on, did you have any comments or questions about the cap? Well, feel free to chime in whenever you would like. Um, does anybody have any questions off the bat for John and Richard about the recommendation? Go ahead, Tom. Uh, <clears throat> John and Richard, I was just curious about uh, upgrading uh, electric panels, about what kind of costs are we talking about? What would it cost to do that? I have a personal reason, reason to ask it, because if I electrify totally, I will have to do that. But uh, what kind of cost do you, do you think it would be? So there's actually ways around some of the, the issues that people have with totally electrifying. So if you have a actually a 100 amp panel, there are um, switches that you can install so that you can switch back and forth between dr like a dryer and other and and running an EV, for example, that's a co common switch. I can't remember what it, the name of it is, but there's uh, so, um, somebody's actually installed it in Muir Woods, um, Muir Commons uh, on their panel. And I've heard of others doing it as well. Um, and so it's it actually the panel how much you have to upgrade the panel depends on how using some of these other uh methods what, what neighborhood do you live in i live in east davis north north of the cemetery okay um oh. and the house is 52 years old yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah you probably have a definitely have an older one so the panels can cost between uh two and five thousand dollars to to install to for an upgrade um one thing is is also you can do it in stages um do you have central air conditioning yes yeah so you can just you have one slot there already for a heat pump Yes, yeah, so we have a heat pump switch. water heater and the heat pump heater uh, heater in the room that I'm sitting in right now. Uh huh. So I mean, we we are totally maxed out right now. Uh huh. Oh. Wow. Well, the the uh, the federal infrastructure law um, is supposed to have some money to also help uh, rebates on panels as well as the heating equipment itself. Yeah. Yeah. Just an, another thing I was just curious about, back to the two of you, the, the people who are uh, fighting against this electrification idea, are they doing it just because they don't want to be told what to do or because they don't like, don't think it's necessary or just what, what is your sense of what, why people are having issues with this? Well, given that all of the all of the people who spoke were realtors i believe that their sense was that it's a potential expense for people who are going to sell their houses um, because often people get permits at the time that they sell their houses um, you know they've done something and then they go and they file for a permit um, and uh and so they 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 see this as something that's going to be coming out of the equity of the people who sell their houses. Um, and um, that's probably the biggest thing. There's, 
some of it is coming from people who probably th that would prefer that it be entirely voluntary but i have to say that for something like this the voluntary compliance rate is going to be very low i do not expect high voluntary this is not like you're setting out your recycling can uh, this is a much bigger effort uh, for people to do um, and so it's going to take a push for people to do it they're not going to do it just because they want to. And there's also a problem that we locally can't raise enough money to uh, probably have everybody electrify. I mean, I, I, have to, I have to take a step back for a second. There is, um, Cornell, or Ithaca has actually gone out and fin is financing electrification of a, of a um, housing stock that is just as old or older than what we've got. Um, and so they are making this effort as well. And they figured out a way to finance it with some a private financing, which is something that probably we should look at more closely of how Ithaca is doing this. But um, there's only so much outside funds that will be available for uh, this community, particularly since we're actually a relatively wealthy community. So we go past some of the income limits that are for some of this. So um, uh, we're gonna have to uh, give some push in order for people to, to comply with this. It's not something that we can count on people to do out of the goodness of their heart. Um, it's, uh, it's, it is, people are gonna have to get, uh, we're gonna have to push people a little bit out of their comfort zone in order to to move forward. I think that once they move forward, it's not, it's probably unlikely that they'll notice much difference. Um, I know my my uh, brother-in-law installed a heat pump in Seattle uh, on his own. He's very a very handy person. Um, and uh, he swapped out an oil fired furnace for a heat pump. And he says he never runs the resistance component of the heat pump up there. And it's much colder there than it is here. Um, so it, it's, uh, I think that that sort of thing, people are very happy with, uh, with uh, their induction cooktops. It doesn't take special pans. It just means you can't use aluminum pans. Everything else works on an induction cooktop. Your, your standard steel pans work. <laughs> and so, um, so this is, uh, you know, there's a couple of mythology, pieces of mythology out there that uh, we need to overcome as well. But I think that in general, um, it, people are gonna be just as happy after they electrify as they did before. And I wanna note too, that when the power went out, my gas appliances did not work. <laughs> my, I, my, my stove, I could get my stove top to go, you know, it, with a with a uh, with a hand lighter, but uh, nothing else worked. And I usually could have just pulled out my camp stove if I needed needed it for that uh, uh, period of time to cook. Um, not, and not a not a hard thing to overcome. So um, well, I don't think we can speak directly, perhaps, to the motivations of the of the folks speaking in front of council, but. Sure enough, this extra extra costs is going to be an issue for people in town um, if you have to upgrade your panel. And then there's this this extra component of it, the, the the job being more complicated by the fact that you have to interface with PG&E. And now uh, you heard some of the public comments, people waiting months and months to actually you know, get their new panel um, approved and installed from the utility side. So I, it's it's a concern that really needs to be uh, uh, considered here. Mm -hmm. Stephen, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry, I apologize for getting in late. Um, and Richard, thank you for your reference to <laughs> Ithaca, New York. I was actually there in July of last uh, last summer and in part to visit my niece in Ithaca, but uh, my uh, late uncle, Glenn, Brewer worked for General Electric for 40 plus years and was involved in the intertype between uh, California, Oregon and California, the Bonneville Dam and so forth. So kind of a, an aside. Um, one of the things I saw in the next door traffic was 
people appreciating having natural gas during the power outages. They at least had hot water and, and so forth. And I, maybe you covered this, Richard or, or John, but there was mention of some sort of device that for those who still have natural gas water heaters that could kick in and generate electricity. Could you maybe restate what you said about that if you did? I didn't say anything in particular about that other than you have to put a, a um, battery, like it's, sometimes you have your a battery backup for your computers sitting in your office. Uh -huh. You have to put that kind of unit next to your hot water heater in order to run the thermostat. Okay. And you have and to be willing to go and install that backup unit and spend the money to do that in order to get something, something. That's something that plumbers, some plumbers would be up to date on. I don't right. know. It's electrical. Plumbers it's aren't electricians. Electric. <laughs> Got it. Okay. So I don't know. It seems to me that that's kind of a reach for you know trying to justify uh, it, why you need to hang on to a gas heater uh, or a gas water heater. My gas water heater did not work. Mm. You know, and my furnace didn't work because the thermostat didn't work without mm. electricity. So, um, so that you know that most people aren't thinking about this added investment for running backup uh, on their electric, on their gas appliances. Right. So our, our outages in our neighborhood were two. One was about 13 and a half hours, one 12. And we fired up our fireplace for the first time in two or three years just to, for warmth. And so it's a, that's a backup, let alone your comment about the camp stove. So we uh, we survived. It wasn't as long as uh, some other parts of the town. Yeah, I was I was out forty eight hours to, for the first one and twelve hours for the second one. Yeah. So sixty hours total over a week. Yeah. Well, thank you for restating some of what you talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, and one other thing I wanted to point out too is that PG&E just um, issued a new green book which is, it's their guide for how they uh, manage and distribute their existing distribution system. And the new green book is actually changing the criteria and the evaluation process for how they decide to allocate costs for um, uh, upgrading their distribution system. And it appears instead of individuals having to pay for an entire transformer upgrade in a neighborhood, they're gonna allocate those costs over I'm not sure over it. I have to have and looked in the detail, but they're going to allocate it over a much larger group of customers. So these high expenses we've seen for people for upgrading the PG&E systems are not going to be there uh, going forward now that the, they just issued this in the last month. Yeah, that's really good to know. Jacob, do you have any comments? Um. I do have some comments. Um, I'm wondering though, uh, sorry, can you remind me, are we going, are we going to um, uh, public comment first and then coming back for a general discussion? Oh, yeah, um, sure, let's open for a public comment. All right, uh, Chris, go ahead. Oh, I have to upgrade you to panelists, sorry. And I am not able to do that. Carrie, can you yeah, upgrade? I, I can I can see found a way to get to it. Go ahead, Chris. Hi everyone. Uh, this is Chris Granger from Cool Davis. Um, uh, listening in both on the, the last item and then this this item, I um, have uh, several comments. I just um, I really want to say uh, that um, I c c agree so much with uh, Carrie with the uh, the surprise of the um, item coming up in the and the way the, the comments came forward um, at the council meeting that the staff um, didn't have um, all the data and things that um, and a response prepared for this um, particular uh, challenge and. <clears throat> That said, I, I I really truly believe that um, that this proposal to kind of go back to the council and reconsider some of this is is what uh, could be thought out um, and um, presented with other data 
including just basic information about what's in the Inflation Reduction Act and is available to people in our community right now, um, and that that could really, um, it might have its impacts on the, the decision. And so I guess I would encourage um, the staff and, and the NRC to think about how you might go about doing that and um, um, how to make that kind of uh, kind of really detailed presentation back to council about really where we are with um, a voluntary action um, and what it might mean going forward. I'd like to just add also that we we have been in a voluntary action state since 2010. There have been multiple incentive programs to um, uh, incentivize different actions related to getting off of natural gas and um, and electrifying our homes. And we have a record here in our community of that. And um, we should be talking about that as well, um, because uh, I think um, uh, Carrie's right that and, and several of you have mentioned also that going from this sort of 10% uh, return that we have right now to getting over 50 or 60% um, is, is really um, going to be a heavy lift and very costly to do. Um, and um, the biggest factor is whether or not our contractors are on board to deliver, um, to, to be promoting uh, a, um, the adoption of electrification. And right now they have, um, they have no incentive to do that. So um, uh, anyway, um, thanks for bringing um, these ideas forward. And uh, Cool Davis is available to work with you on, um, on uh, just reconsideration. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay, and I think it looks like that is our only public comment. So we can go back to commissioner discussion. Um, Jacob, do you wanna kick us off? Sure, thank you, and sorry to uh, throw off the, the um, order of things there. Um, I appreciate it, I always, I always forget, thank you. Um, but yeah, I, and I really appreciate John and Richard, you two putting this together. Um, I think the uh, the level of detail here is impressive and like slicing and dicing this issue between the existing capacity, I think is a really promising direction to take it. Um, this does, I think this directly responds to a lot of the um, worry we heard about like uh, from, from a lot of the commenters in, in different areas of um, you know, the time it takes to upgrade those panels, the cost that it takes um, to upgrade those panels. And I, so I think splitting it in this manner makes things like, um, you know, uh, I, I think this is a convincing kind of way we can do it that will get us closer to achieving those targets, um, but also responding to some of these concerns spe uh, specifically regarding costs. Um, I also, uh, our, our conversation today about some of those costs is timely because uh, about like five hours ago, the, um, the um, Instagram account for the for the president started posting a bunch of facts on this stuff. So six, you can get six hundred dollars in your twenty twenty three tax credit if you upgrade your panels and are below a certain income level. And they've they're doing like a series of these things. So our our timing with this conversation, I think, is is very unique because as Meg also led with this, uh, the gas appliance thing is also getting some heat. Um, as as uh, or becoming a bigger issue as folks are also identifying how harmful it is to public health. Um, so I think you know it's a it's a really obviously a really important measure in the cap. And I think what you've proposed so far in this uh, as your kind of summary of recommendations at the end of this um, is a really great place to start. And and I think I would support it. Um, I would I would say so. We have you have some kind of um, targets for um uh um sorry um voluntary compliance um in your recommendations you're saying you know maybe around like 75 percent i would encourage if this is to go to the council that those compliance targets be based off of um quantifiable targets or like be based off of achieving that 2030 emissions reductions um you know if it doesn't look like we're on track for that then it becomes um mandatory or further measures become mandatory. That would be my one of my recommendations um, for this. Um, I would also I also wonder too, 
if we're talking about appliances that need permitting and it's under a voluntary process, is there a way that we can integrate some of this education and outreach directly into the permitting process? Can we make it a requirement to, in order to receive a permit, that you also have to, um, you know, receive a packet of information from the city? Or if it's a, um, you know, a third party installing this, going out for the permit, make it a requirement that they've presented this information to the client, to the homeowner, prior to doing the installation, prior to getting the permit, they need to, you know, sign something to show that they're that way, even if they're not, if this isn't what the installer wants to do, at least the, we know that the homeowner is is being educated. I'm not sure if that would come at the right time in this permitting process. Um, I don't know if that I don't I don't have a good enough handle on what that permitting process looks like. But if possible, that might be, um, I don't know, kind of a hook we can get into the process to make sure that the um, information is getting across. So, so two recommendations there of, of um, slight changes, but overall, just uh, really thankful for you all putting the time in um, to present this. And I think it's, um, I, I agree with the sentiment that it wasn't necessarily known that the city council's um, uh, recommendations would result in in a big change to our, us achieving the minimum targets. So I think this is uh, could be well received and is well timed as well. Thanks, Jacob. So just to make sure that I'm understanding the takeaways from your comment, I'm hearing, first of all, that a recommendation to include, to base the compliance target on what the minimum rate of compliance is to meet the 2030 greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals. That's correct. Yeah. We're, and we're, then, we're, yeah. And then so. also um, make sure that people are receiving information about electrification at the time that they apply for a permit, even if they're not required to do it. Yeah, correct. Having that be like a formal part or requirement of the permitting process. Okay. Yeah. And I think to add to that, that could also include information about the fact that the it will be required by this date starting in 2030. Okay, awesome. Uh, Kira, do you have any comments? I don't really have anything additional to add other than I really enjoyed reading the recommendation. I thought it was really well thought out and worded. So I appreciate both of you putting in the time to do that for all of us. Thank you. Thanks, Kira. Michelle, do you have any comments? I'll just say I really did like what uh, Jacob just added. I think that's uh, some really great advice. So I love to include that as part of the recommendation that we move forward with this. And uh, just making it positive, I heard what John was saying earlier that you're looking to, you're asking NRC to recommend staff consider this comment letter. Is that sort of the way it's, the way you're thinking? Or just clarify that for me, please. Actually, we may have to get some clarification from you, Carrie. Um, <clears throat> the NRC supposedly talks to city council, not to staff, although staff knows everything that we say, of course. Um, so I suppose this could be a, we've done memos in the past to city council making recommendations. Um, the one that comes to mind immediately would be um, putting sustainability into staff reports as a, as a regular item. And so that was a direct communication back to city council um, Carrie, what what suggestion would you have for how to best communicate these ideas? Uh, it is true that the NRC is an advisory body to city council. Um, as we were discussing this item and whether it was going to be sort of like layered under the cap discussion or a separate item or how we were going to do it. We pulled it out as a separate item, partly because you were considering a motion to send this information to council. And we wanted to make sure that was fully identified in the, in the agenda and the materials that were sent out. Um, one of the thoughts as we were discussing this was that this could come to staff. And I felt that some of this was really, um, part of the implementation roadmaps. Um, but given that council is going to have to decide how to proceed, given that there are 
some significant impact to this motion, um, we can certainly put it in the minutes and send it to city council for their advisement or send it separately. So I think that the way that the <coughs> item is identified in the agenda is that you as a commission are being asked by one of your subcommittees to approve this recommendation to send to council. And along the way, it would go through staff and we would write a staff report to accompany the recommendation should that be the way it goes. Um, so I think that answers the question. And before you complete this item, I would like to add a couple of thoughts um, in response to Tom's question about why are people opposed to this, but I don't want to interrupt your discussion. So. Okay. I'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll come back to you before um, you move on with anything. Let's see where, um, who did I miss? Um, Tom, did you have any additional comments? I know you asked questions earlier. Uh, no, no, nothing more of it. I'm curious to hear what Carrie has to say. Uh, okay. But I did want to uh, thank John and Richard for their uh, for their work on this. Okay, cool. I think I just have a couple um, small. I think I agree with Jacob's comment about having about the minimum compliance rate, um, and I think also it would be helpful to add information about what's in the IR about in the Inflation Reduction Act in addition to the information that's already in here about PG&E. Uh, and yeah, Richard, go ahead. You're still muted. I'm trying to do two things at once. Uh, so I have a typed up resol resolution or motion that I would probably advance. Um, and I can share that uh, <laughs> okay. in a minute after. I mean, we, let's get through the discussion and then I can put that up. But um, to to basically as a, a motion that would uh, move along our memo and send it to city council <clears throat> and okay. to the staff. Isn't that, that, isn't that the motion that you put at the top? Is that the same one or is it different? Uh, do we have a motion at the top of that one? I can't remember. Yes. yes. Oh, if we do, then then I don't need to add one. Never mind. Okay, so Carrie, do you want to go ahead and and tell us your thoughts. Um, well, I um, I just wanted to I, sort of as a devil's advocate here, um, some of the comments that have been made during this discussion is that the only that the main reasons that people are opposed to this are based on the cost of the upgrades and the time it takes to do them. Some information about PG&E and that it's realtors only. And I don't think that having looked at the comments earlier on during the public comment process that that really encompasses all of the concerns. Um, and so I just want to caution you that there are a number of people that don't want anybody telling them what to do in their house. Um, there are a number of people that have preferences for different types of appliances and they don't wanna to be told what yeah what to do. Um, and there's also concern that there would be a differential approach. And this really came up in the point of sale one. Like somebody said, if I want to sell my house, then I have to upgrade. But somebody next to me with the same type of house doesn't have to upgrade. That's not fair to me. So um, just to be aware, and this doesn't have to impact your your discussion or your decision, because I think this is some really good background research, but I think you should be aware that there will be some outcry um, by people in the community that say, just because I have a newer house or, um, you know, a more adequate panel, then I have to make these changes, but somebody that hasn't upgraded their house doesn't have to. Um, so I, th I think it's important to be aware that 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 there are some strong opinions on this. And that is pretty well indicated by the fact that there were 28 actions in the cap, many of which are relatively controversial, but all, all of the energy, quote, energy was focused on the electrification actions. Um, and the final thing is, um, just to clarify, we did have some of this information. We just didn't put it about how this would impact the, um, um, the targets, 
but we didn't put it in the presentation because it had it was kind of in the cap but not highlighted and the problem when you go to council is you have the time to make your presentation and then once it gets into community comment and commission and council discussion you're a little bit limited at how much you can just kind of like expound on on your opinion you have to kind of turn it over to council so um there was a bit of that problem in in not having very clearly put forward how important that 7% of building energy is within the actions that we can have an impact on in the cap. So, so I think um, we're running about 20 minutes over on this item and I know Brian has joined us and is um, waiting for that discussion. So I think we can do maybe final comments and then try to make the motion. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I recognize there probably be will be some resistance. I think that the resistance, even though it will be relatively loud, will be a, a minority of residents. But I will also point out that people, when they sell their houses, frequently have to upgrade, make major investments in upgrading their house. And an example is my house, where the seller actually had to give a $60,000 discount for all the things that they had to upgrade in their house to comply with all of the city regulations on buildings. So, uh, you know, this is, it's not any different uh, than other, other ones. And we just have to be prepared to respond to people who say that this is somehow exceptional. Um, and, and since we do have the appliance upgrade requirement for people who are um, the BE1 as well versus BE2, um, the, the it's not true that their neighbors won't have to replace their appliance. They'll just have to do it when they uh, when they replace the appliance. They'll have to replace it with an electric one. Um, but I do think we we do have to look at how we craft the sale one, which is why um, this memo doesn't have much on that uh, that aspect. I think that that one's going to take more thought about how we uh, implement the time of sale measure versus the um, at time of replacement uh, for doing that. Um, so um, I think that that's going to be uh, something that we'll be able to address going forward. We just have to be careful about how we do it and how we communicate with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it is also important to remember, like we're not city council and they will make their decision based on information that we're giving them and what they're hearing elsewhere. And I think it's our role to provide our perspective on it and also more information, which is here and hopefully will be helpful to them and also helpful to staff when you're preparing for the meeting. But everybody will will mm -hmm. take this and use it as they will. Right. We're not the final arbiters here. <laughs> so one thing we could do is is not try to be too prescriptive here and we could take the memo maybe with with Jacob's uh suggestion which I like about the the compliance rate and and make it into a, a communication to city council saying uh perhaps we should add just a little bit at the top that says we would we would appreciate you reconsidering your decision and here's what we'd like to tell you about it and that's probably the the, the uh, gentlest and and um, <laughs> um, most mannered way of talking to them. And if people like that approach, uh, we could make that into a motion, as opposed to a resolution that says we think you made a bad decision and we want you to change it. Yeah, I think. Okay, yeah, anyway, go ahead, Jacob. I, I think that, I guess that uh, does make sense to me, um, approaching it as like an informational uh, advisory item, something that we can we can provide the city council with context because Meg, your point is uh, is a very valid one. And Carrie, thank you for the context uh, and the reminders there too. It's um, We are one voice, I guess, in this discussion. Um, and it makes sense for us to fall, uh, if, our, if our united voice falls a little bit, 
further to one side of, of pushing the city and the residents to make this step. I think that's okay because this is the Natural Resource Commission and objective, objectively, you know, this is a a positive uh, step for the environment. So I think it, I think it, but we can still frame, we can come out clearly on the side of making the measure stronger while still approaching it in an advisory type tone like you're uh, uh, proposing here, John. Would anybody like to take a stab at turning that into a motion? I'm not going to do that verbally, but I just would say that I'd be more likely to support it if it comes through as more of a consider this kind of way rather than verbatim. Carrie, can you, um, would it be helpful to share the, the document? It's probably just the beginning that we really need to look at how to get this thing started. I mean, I could show you what I wrote, another sure. uh, um, proposed motion that's actually pretty gentle, I think. Um, if I, can I share my screen? Oops, you're on mute, Carrie. Carrie, you're on, yeah. Is it the same one that went out in the document this afternoon? No, it's a it's a oh. much shorter one. The one that I put at the top, John. Remember, it's the, the yeah. It's, that's it's, what. Okay, that's in today's document. Is it okay? I don't have that version for some reason, and I don't have it in the version that you guys sent back to me. So, <laughs> I'm I'm flying blind. Okay, just a minute. Let me. Um... This is going to take me a second. Sorry, I have a small screen here. Nope, that's not it. Are um are you able to give Richard screen sharing? Yeah, here it is. Richard doesn't have the one that we're yeah, looking for. Uh, yeah, go, let's has... see what Carrie puts up here. It's the one that I'm th thinking of. For some reason I just not able to find that either in my email or on my computer. Just a minute, I am I have a lot of things open. <laughs> okay, can you see that? Yeah. Yes. Yep. Okay, yeah, the yeah, that's paragraph. the one I'm thinking of. Okay. Uh, do you, does somebody want to read it or do you want me to read it? Uh, it's kind of Richard, why don't you read this? Sure. Uh, the NRC supports a structured approach to implementing and evaluating actions BE1, replacing glass, gas appliances and furnaces at time of retirement and BE2, replacing gas appliances and furnaces at time of sale. The description of each voluntary phase should include specific tasks and steps and a specified quantitative benchmark for determining success. In addition, residences with certain characteristics, such as larger electrical panels and or central air conditioning that are readily able to electrify most or all applications should be included in a mandated replacement program under action BE1. And the part I was gonna add to this is the, uh, the, the NRC is conveying an attached memo which describes in detail uh, a proposed method for implementing these two actions. And that memo would be the rest of this document? 
or the uh, other document? Um, the new one, right? It would probably be, I mean, this one is probably, I think this one will be uh, a good one to send to the city council. And the staff has the more detailed one that they can use for the how they want to lay this out. This this memo describes in sufficient detail as to what oh, is required. And okay. I think we probably need to add Jacob's uh, part <laughs> about the two things that he suggested adding that probably need to be added to this in some fashion as well. Um, so I'm going to suggest that we add that under the problems meeting greenhouse gas reduction targets. <laughs> the, or um, importance of meeting greenhouse gas reduction targets maybe. And then that could be where we specify that um, the, that adoption rate should be calculated. There's a spot at the end for um, the evaluating the pilot program. Mm. Uh, um, where, uh, let's where stop that. Can, stop that uh, let me see. This is pilot the, program right here. All right, go a little bit lower. Okay, here, I think NRC suggests, and then um, I had the, I had the 100% aspirational, but maybe drop it back to 75. I mean, Jacob, oh, it's in the this. summary of recommendations. Oh, okay. Yeah. Further down. Second bullet under BE-1 on the last page of the document. There we go. So we could we could change that seventy five to uh, match uh, Jacob's suggestion, but a rate, but the rate uh, a calculated rate or a rate calculated to meet the target would be acceptable. Um, yeah, like the minimum adoption rate that will still meet the twenty thirty greenhouse gas emission reduction target. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you should just change it to 60%, which I think covers that. And it's all, you know, like projected. So attaching your rate to a projected not certain percentage could be problematic. But if you say 60%, we believe at this point that that um, meets it 50 or 60 percent, whichever you want to do. Okay, so let's let me suggest that you say, but a lower replacement rate such as 60 percent may be acceptable if it meets the minimum GHG target. Yeah, yeah, if the city is on, is still on track to meet the right, if the city is still on track to meet the, the target. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I, I would like to caution you again, and again, this is your recommendation, mm -hmm. so you can do whatever you want, but having a time of sale in there at all is very much a red flag, and I'm not sure how much it does for you. Well, it's just saying to implement a public outreach program and monitor, monitor the voluntary conversion rate, so I think... Yeah, I, I think that's consistent with what the the um, with what the council said la back in May that they have a voluntary program and you evaluate it in the future. You can just uh, understand why I'm very sensitive <laughs> to all of this, given the community input. So I'm trying to uh, make some comments that might more easily ensure success of this for you. But I'm wondering if maybe we can change the language instead of saying to promote time of sale conversions, maybe we can say to support residents in making time of sale conversions. I, I don't see there being a problem with promoting it because we do want to promote it. 
I mean, that was the whole idea was that mm -hmm. behind that, I don't think that the, I don't think the council was hostile to the idea of promoting conversion. I think what I they're yeah, worried about is mandating it. But I think it's the a lot of the emphasis was on the need for there to be more outreach and education and support for um for people who want to do this. And the recommendation here is that there should be more public outreach on financing options. So I mm -hmm. think it could, it's still the same thing, but could potentially sound. I, I think it's more it's, I don't know. It's it sounds kind of more collaborative to so to support to be supporting people who are interested or even if they're not interested. Well, I have to I have to admit to agreeing with Carrie that these two bullets don't really say anything major that needs to be said. And if there is no mention of BE2 anywhere in this document, will not raise issues with people for whom BE2 is an issue because we're not really addressing BE2. Mm. I, I think if we're silent yeah. on BE2, it, it doesn't hurt and, and it will help. Yeah. I, I agree. Both of these bullet points are very soft. They're not forcing anybody to do anything. They're just saying, here's the deal, think about it. And that's it. I think these are just fine like they are. Yeah, I, well, I would say the one thing that's in there is that it asks for an evaluation in three years, which I don't remember if that's in the current yeah. climate action plan. I think that's implied though, by the fact that the, the action, the cap is gonna be re, uh, it's going to be updated on a three to five year basis. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if this was a motion, I would I would propose an amendment to drop references to BE two. Yeah, I, I think that's acceptable. Okay. Do we vote? Do I get votes on that now or? You, do you have an official motion? No. Do you want me to repeat what I have as the motion? Oh, please. Well, yeah, I guess, yeah. Okay, so I have the motion, what is at the top of this page, starting with the NRC supports a structured approach, and then at the end of that, uh, and take out BE2, reference to BE2, uh, remove that completely, and at the end, of the statement, um, add that the NRC has additional details in a memo. And also in those additional details under the second bullet at the end of the page that we just looked at is to at change to 60%. And if it meets the GHG target, that's based on Jacob's input. That's it. Is that right? Yes, that's that that's uh, consistent with the motion that I'm making. Okay. Okay, and yeah. I'll second. I'll second the motion in that form. So we would only be supporting a structured approach to implementing and evaluating actions BE one. Yes. And then take out and BE two and that description, and then the rest of that remains the same. The description of each voluntary phase. Blah blah blah. Um, and then at the end, um, the NRC has provided attack has provided details, and so that those details are the rest of this whole memo, the way it is now, taking out BE one BE two in every instance, and then down at the bottom, down here, summary of recommendations under BE one, the second bullet right in this location would say such as 60% may be judged acceptable if it meets the minimum, if it um, projects to meet the minimum greenhouse gas reduction target for 2030, and then take out all the BE2 things at the end. And I have that motion made by Richard and seconded by John. Okay. Tom? Uh, I. Kira? Aye. 
Jacob, Michelle. I'm going to abstain. OK. Um, I am an I. There's one missing. I have oh. me. Oh, Richard. Sorry. <laughs> I. And John. I. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. Well, th thank you both again for your work on that. I think it's really. I think it'll be really helpful to have more, more details and and information about that. And Thanks I appreciate finding a specific, finding, finding some kind of specific steps forward to still hopefully stay on track. Is this in slideshow mode? I can't tell. It's no. in the edit mode. Okay. Or what we're seeing here. Um, I think, so if you go down. By the way, you did have one. Um, you finished public comment, but you had a public commenter with their hand raised um, during that discussion. So, okay. This is so. If you go, yeah, I got it. Okay. Okay. All right. So now we have discussion with Brian Fenty about more building electrification <laughs> and reach codes. Um. So. Brian, we appreciate you bearing with us and thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. Especially uh, coming from uh, your wine tasting venue there. Yeah, right, yes. Well, you always like to keep the important stuff front and center. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me really. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I've been listening to the discussion and you guys really get into some uh, very good heated debates and, and there's a lot of points there. Um, that could be commented on, you know, I want to talk tonight about the new codes, but something that I did hear um, over and over again was kind of uh, on the one side was the public outcry for these, these changes for the, the cap and the, you know, the requirements to go electric and, and to counter that, it seems to me that, you know, maybe some public outreach and public education would be in order, right? Um, how do we convince people to do the things that we want them to do? You know, how do we convince them that they think that they want to do it? Because, you know, we all know sitting here tonight, we all know that, um, you know, going electric, reducing greenhouse gases is the right thing to do. It's just that a lot of people are stuck in their ways. So that might be something to think about. Another little tidbit that I heard about too was suggestions about doing this electrical and doing that electrical and and some people with smaller services you know smaller electric services finding a way to go all electric and i would just caution the commission that there are a lot of people out there that are coming up with very um offbeat ideas that don't meet the electrical code and uh, and a, a big part of what we're doing is, you know, to sustain our planet and so that we can go on. But if we end up uh, injuring ourselves and burning our house down in the meantime, you know, that's uh, not a good idea. So I, I would just caution you all to kind of adopt the concept that a lot of this stuff is not meant for the do-it-yourself homeowner. Mm. Um, there needs to be professionals involved and 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 when we talk about those professional heating companies that really all they want to do is gas heaters, well, again, we have to convince them why uh, why they really want to do heat pumps. So enough said on that subject. That's my soapbox. Um, two seconds, but you know, just to talk briefly about the the codes, the new building codes that um, I think you guys all know that that the model codes which are you know 12 volumes of books really huge and and every year um, you know professionals like myself and many others we participate in the meetings and we go to the big conventions and we vote on the code changes and then every three years those are actually published into a national standard and of course our state of Cal california does some amendments to that and then you know we adopt the California uh, Building Standards Code. 
um, with that, we make our own changes, you know, so, so this past year, we took it to council in October uh, and introduced the new code books. In November, we had the public hearing and it was uh, unanimously approved to adopt those codes. And uh, the 2022 codes went into effect January 1st of 2023, which as Carrie mentioned earlier, you know, seems to be the, the norm in our business, right? So the, the next code cycle will be the 2025 codes, which will get modified, amended, and adopted in the year of 2025, and then actually go into effect January of 2026. Um, and, and that goes on every three years, you know, until we retire. Um, this year, uh, our, our friends in the consortium of um, REACH codes, you know, all the other cities and counties and folks that get together and talk about what we can do better, what we can do more than the standard codes require, uh, they were a little behind. And so what we did this year is we we adopted the exact same changes as we had before. You know, again, the California Green Building Code, the California Energy Code, and then with our minor changes that we had uh, put into effect in 2019, we just re-upped those again for another three years. And then, you know, Carrie and I have had in the back of our mind that, you know, sometime over the course of this next six to 12 months, um, we are continually uh, reevaluating that and discussing it. And at some point, we'll prepare a report to bring to you guys, the, the Resources Commission, and then also to bring to City Council, you know, in hopes to adopt new changes to uh, the REACH codes and maybe take it a little bit further. Um, but I, I did hear also in your discussions about people and people in general and how some people are just really resistant to being told what they can do with their their own castle, so to speak. Um, and, you know, to me, that just kind of seems like a challenge where what we have to do, what we're faced with is, you know, really showing these people why it is that we want to do these things. I mean, the CAP itself is a really monumental document. And, and I think, you know, it's a roadmap for our future, but there's a lot of people out there that aren't thinking about next year or five years or 10 years from now, they're just barely surviving today. So those are the people that we need to reach out to and connect with and, and kind of show them, you know, why we need to make these changes in our, in our communities and, and in our society as a whole and, you know, and, and try not to be just a one-time use sort of uh, mindset where we buy something, use it up and throw it away. So that's my two cents. Um, I don't know, can I entertain any questions about our new codes? What you guys may wonder or what, may you, what, what you may think? Yeah, so I think maybe we'll open up to public comment first and then we'll hear questions and comments. Chris, go ahead. Oh, do we need to bump Chris up to to be a participant first? And Carrie, you are not muted, or you are muted. You are not. Yeah. Okay, Chris, you can uh, speak now. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Um, First, I want to note that in your last discussion, the document that you um, viewed um, was the first time that anybody from the public had seen that. So um, and for future processes, you might want to figure out a way to make it least readable and available for people to so and ahead of the time that um, they're commenting. Mm -hmm. um, so my comments were not made in reference to that document, but to the one that was posted with the agenda. That um, was an error on my part, just by the way. I thought I had attached that one, but I had attached a v previous version. Um, so. so just in terms of process during the meeting, um, it would be helpful. Um, I just wanted to ask um, specifically regarding uh, 
this question about timing for the next reach code. It's my understanding that the next reach code timeframe for the state is 2026. And so when um, th there's this question that I think the staff raised with the council that somehow they would not be within if they if we were going to go forward with a new ordinance related to electrification, we wouldn't be able to meet the timeline with the state if it didn't happen. Our work didn't get done before January of 2026. So I just wanted to ask if that's true. Uh, I don't think that's an accurate summary. Reach codes can be, and Brian, I don't want to jump ahead of you, but reach codes can be adopted by cities at any point during the year. Many cities choose to do their reach codes to be effective at the same time as state codes out of the ease of implementing for staff and community, but there is no requirement that they are done at the same time. So we could do a reach code in six months or a year or on January 1st, 2026. Brian, go ahead if you, if I. No, I think you're 100% correct, Carrie. It really can be done anytime. And you know, I think the overarching goal of, of even having a reach code is just to go a little bit above and beyond, um, you know, the minimum building standards. I mean, most of the rest of the building codes uh, are, are a minimum standard. Um, you know, there's a, a number of avenues that are kind of going further than that. And, and even when we look at today's code, you know, the 2022 um, energy code and the green building code and the rest of the codes, um, everything is gearing towards all electric communities. You know, uh, the, the, the new requirements, um, you know, for new development, for new construction is that, you know, at this point in the state anyway, if you go with mixed fuel, if you put in some gas appliances, you still have to put in all the electrical infrastructure and have the room in your panel to go all electric. Now, I think part of what we're trying to do is incentivize uh, the developers to just go all electric right now, you know, and, and so we, we make the mixed fuel end of it be a little bit harder, you know, saying that if you're going to go with a mixed fuel development, then you have to meet a higher energy standard than you would if you go with an all electric development. Um, but yeah, Carrie's right. I mean, it, it can be written anytime. We probably would have taken it with the 2022 code adoption, except the, the big issue was that, um, that cost effectiveness study that just, it wasn't done, it wasn't published yet. And you can't do anything above and beyond unless you have the cost effectiveness study to support what you wanna do. And uh, it's really hard for most cities, nine out of 10 cities to be able to afford to do that on their own. And so I think that's why cities and counties and even the state kind of come together to produce that sort of a document and then you know, cities and counties take it further in their reach code applications. Does that make sense, Chris? I'll, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> <laughs> because it's timely, can I ask? Um, one of the reasons I, I was trying to get Brian to come talk was that a lot of the people on the commission now are new since we last did this exercise and are not familiar with the words reach code, cost effectiveness study, and things of that nature. Could you give us like a little five-minute primer on that? Oh, I can try my best. Um, you know, I, I'm not the total expert. Uh, I, I just know how to build things. Uh, but, you know, the, the long and the short of it is that the, the California Energy Commission, um, you know, publishes our energy code and they lay down the minimum requirements, you know, for all different types of con construction, you know, residential, multifamily, non-residential, meaning commercial. Um, in there, there's 
mandatory requirements, meaning these are the bare bone minimums everybody has to comply with. And then there's tier one and tier two, which at a state level, those are voluntary. Um, you know, the state says, you know, you can you can go for the achievement of tier one, which is a higher standard, or even tier two, again, a higher standard, um, but they don't require it. Now, in Davis, with our last reach code, we've taken it a step further and said that, um, you know, all new construction is required to meet tier one levels. Um, you know, which again at the state is just voluntary. So for us, it's mandatory. Um, what the cost effectiveness study has to do with that is that the Energy Commission says cities and counties, you're allowed to do amendments or changes to these codes, but you can only do those changes if you can show that the changes will be cost effective. In other words, it's not gonna cost somebody so much money and have a very little return. It, it has to cost a reasonable amount and have a very strong return. Otherwise, what's the point in the investment? And can people even afford it, right? Um, we talked about the, the, the less affluent side of town where you know somebody's not gonna be able to afford a $5,000 electric service upgrade. So, you know, that's where the cost effectiveness study comes in to play um, is that it, it shows, you know, the pros and the cons dollars and cents wise and can something work out, you know, uh, on a real simple scale to say, switching out your gas range and putting in uh, an induction range um, is, I, I would say is just very cost effective. Right, it's a it's a simple process. It doesn't cost that much money. Um, you, you know, you're gonna spend money on your electric bill for your range, but you would have spent the money on your gas bill for your range. So it's probably gonna balance out about the same for the end user. And it's just the invent the the um, investment that it takes up front, and then some counties and, and sometimes with utilities, they offer financial rebates on those. So all that comes into play in the cost effectiveness and whether or not it's worth the investment um, to, to generate the end results. Does that answer your question? It does for me, thank you. Any other, any other burning questions from commissioners? Others I can also go through one by one. Yeah, yeah Jacob, I, go ahead. Thank you. I was just hoping to check uh, that you could check my understanding here on the um, the energy efficiency part of the REACH code that you cited in the um, staff report. So where it says um, the section incentivize all electric new construction by requiring a 9.5 to 10% compliance margin. When it when you're talking about that compliance margin, is that uh, were you saying earlier that's like um, they have to be nine to ten percent more energy efficient than um, like an all electric home. Is that is that what's being referred to with that margin term? Um, I think in a nutshell, yes. Although it probably doesn't translate a hundred percent like that. The uh, the energy rating of the building, um, you know, comes from a, a couple of different factors. Um, you know, we get an energy rating based on the building design, and then uh, if it has solar, that's added into the program, and you end up with what they call a, a total energy rating uh, grade, so to speak. And, um, and I think what we're trying to say is that if you go uh, mixed fuel, you have to achieve a higher grade in your overall design. So in other words, you're gonna to have to make up for it somewhere else, right? And probably it'll be a number of other locations, right? The, the insulation value of the property, um, the north, south, east, west orientation comes into play, the, the amount of glazing comes into play, and even the, the U values and R values of the glazing itself. 
Um, so all these things come into play. And, and again, you know, in a nutshell, we're saying that if you go all electric, we'll allow you to have a, a slightly lesser grade in your design. And if you go with mixed fuel, then we're going to require a higher grade in your design. And, and part of that thought process is that, you know, even though they have mixed fuels, let's say gas for the heating, um, you know, they have higher values in the rest of the building. So we're still going to be saving uh, on that gas heating bill. And, and therefore, we're going to be saving on the greenhouse gases that are produced and going up the vent pipe. And if I could just add, um, Brian, because um, you're so close to this, maybe um, the, the compliance margin is established by the state cost effectiveness study. So it says you can, okay, here's the building code with the energy code part of it. And any um, agency could say, okay, you can go whatever they determine. It could be 5%. A particular year, it could be eight percent, it could be nine or ten percent higher, and you're still energy efficient with any of those things that Brian mentioned. Mm -hmm. So three years ago, when we did the reach code for residential units, it was ten percent. I think I've got this right, and for non-residential, it was nine percent, or vice versa. And so that compliance margin that was established by the state is what was used by the city of Davis to say. For mixed fuel only, you have to do that higher compliance margin. But as an incentive to go to electric, you can just meet the state code. Mm -hmm. That's where the difference is. And the reason it has to be all or nothing is because if you even install natural gas, then you, homeowners have the option of using natural gas. So essentially, part of the cost savings for developers is not having to install natural gas lines at all. So um, the analysis that was done back in 2019 and the staff report that's on our website explains what some of the cost savings for developers are. And I think that's just what you said, Brian, only I just wanted to clarify that it was the city of Davis choice to use that compliance margin as the carrot mm -hmm. um, for mixed fuel only. So, mm -hmm. very well said. I appreciate it. <clears throat> um, do you wanna, one more question? I'll, add, I'll add one more thing, I'm sorry. Um, right now, this year, for the first time in this latest um, rollout of things, there's actually two ways to um, look at electrification. In the past, it was always based on building code and um, cost effectiveness studies. And so you would do it through a building code approach like City of Davis did in 2019. But now you can also require electrification through public health and safety, which is a local municipal ordinance rather than, and doesn't require you to go to the California Energy Commission um, or the buildings and, and standards organization. So some, about half and half of communities decide to either go the building code route or decide to go public health and safety because of the dangers of gas. And it's a, it's a choice made by each, um, each agency. Interesting. Well, Tom, did you have any questions? Uh, no. Kira? I do. Um, so first of all, thank you for meeting with us tonight. This is really interesting to hear about. When I was looking at the staff report, there's a section on high rise uh, dwelling. So like high rise apartments having required EV infrastructure for new buildings. Is this something that will also be happening um, to existing buildings or is this just for new developments? Um, well, certainly in new development, you know, both in the, the single family and the multifamily and, and even in commercial. Um, and, and I think that, 
what we see right now is that in a new single family home, you have to put in the infrastructure for that EV charger. Now, it seems like most people are going with electric cars, you know, that we see that over and over and over again. Um, the, the, the flip side, you know, conversely, we don't see a lot of people going all electric on their heating and cooling systems. We do see probably 50% of the people that are choosing an alternative to gas in their water heaters, um, but many people run into problems with that. But, you know, again, back to your EV chargers, yes, there, there are EV charger requirements in the multifamily market. There is the requirement right now for the infrastructure in new single family homes. And then I think eventually we'll see that the, uh, the EV charger has to be, uh, you know, set up. The, probably the one difference today is that there's so many different types of EV chargers, right? It, it depends on your car. Um, and, and frankly, it kind of bugs me that they do that, right? It's like, why don't they just make one style that would fit all cars? You know, they could, but they don't, you know. Um, so, you know, you put in a, a 40 amp circuit for it, you know, uh, in the garage and, and you provide the power source, you know, a box with the power. And then depending on the outlet that you need or the EV charger that can be very easily attached on. Um, but, you know, backing up before that is that the electric service itself has to have enough capacity. It has to have the room. And, and that's what we didn't see in the past. You know, if, if I look at how many people are putting in EV chargers these days, you know, in existing homes, I would say probably 40% of those have to upgrade their electric service just to support the EV charger. And, and the other 60%, you know, they have a larger electric service and they have the capacity. Um, so, you know, the, the moral of that story is that there's lots of little requirements that are coming into play and we see that they've changed in the past, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, today. And we know that five years from now, 10 years from now, there are going to be more requirements and more restrictive. Um, what you guys might not really know about is the way that our system works with all these codes and these rules and everything else so that you know, people out there in the world, the, the developers, the contractors, you know, the homeowners, so that they don't feel like this stuff is getting rammed down their throat, is that it's usually introduced softly, right, over a period of time. We start with discussions, and then we start with small codes, and then we get into bigger requirements, and then we get into further requirements. Well, that's all a balancing act, and the hard part about that is is the other side uh, that we're trying to balance out, which is our environment, right? And many of you would say that, look, we've been talking about getting rid of gas appliances for 20 years, and it's time to really make some traction on that. And, and I would agree with you. Um, but you know, if I tell a homeowner that's building a house or a contractor that you absolutely have to, put in all electric and no gas, they're gonna be resistant to that. You know, so again, I think it comes back down to that, that thing of public outreach and education and how we show <laughs> them that this is the way that you really want to go, you know. Thank you. I have a related question to that, which is just, I imagine you've probably been having these types of conversations and had a lot more of them in your position. And I'm curious what you've learned in terms of where you think a lot of pushback comes from and if you have any experience that you could share about um, kind of how to effectively talk to people about this and explain the benefits in a way that makes sense and doesn't feel like it's getting shoved down their throats, like you said. Yeah. And I think I'm especially curious about your any conversations you might have had with contractors and developers, but also just in general. Um, you know, I think most people, 
contractors and developers, um, you know, they're they're okay with the idea of you know protecting our environment, right? Making a choice that's something green uh, as compared to the alternative. I think most most people are like that. Some people will choose all the way green, even though the dollars and cents don't make any sense. But where a lot of contractors and a lot of homeowners get hung up is in the cost of these items. Now, some items are reasonable and some are not, you know, like, a, a, you know, heat pump water heaters as a whole, they're, they're pretty pricey, you know, um, as compared to just, you know, the small gas tank water heater, you go down to Home Depot and you can get one for $400 and, and you're good. And, and a vast majority of the people are making their decision based on their pocketbook. And, and it's as simple as that, you know? So if we, as a group, if we were all to try and take this further, I think, you know, those discussions need to be had with people about, and I don't know who those people are, but, uh, but you know, we need to have those discussions about the cost of uh, a, a heat pump HVAC system <clears throat> and, and the cost of an alternative to gas water heater, whether it's a heat pump water heater or some other methodology, you know, um, a lot of people come in our door to talk about permits and they, they just want to throw in an electric water heater in their residence. And yet 99% of the electric water heaters that are out there uh, are not energy efficient enough to be approved in the single family residence. You know, so that's a real eye opener for them. They think they're making the right choice and yet the truth is they're not. If you bought one of those things, because I have people that actually buy them and install them and they don't get any permits, so we, you know, we never see it, right? And then they complain that they don't have enough hot water because you can only get like one hot shower out of it and that's it. So uh, I think manufacturing and industry needs to be brought into this to say, you know, hey guys, you know, what can you put out there that is at a reasonable cost? Uh, for replacements and for upgrades in our existing housing market. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Don and Richard, go ahead, John. So my hope in having this meeting, uh, what, I had a couple, and, and one was to um, kind of reestablish a relationship between us and your office. Um, you. Your your predecessor worked very closely with us. I mean, he did all the pushing because he knew so much more than us. But we worked together on that that reach code. Um, and I wanted to try to um, tell you that, well, let you know, introduce ourselves to you so that you know that we are people who are interested in this. Um, you know, obviously not the structural part, but the energy, energy and water part. There's still a group of people in the community who want to talk gray water for sure. Um, so to let you know that we're interested and we want to work with you, we, we appreciate it if you would keep us up to date on um, uh, where the code is going, on ideas you have in mind and uh, for upgrading the code in the future. And then the second hope was then I was just trying to get a sense of what where you thought um, the the field was going. I think you've kind of said some of that, and I'll give you a chance to say more if you want. But you know, where where do you think we're headed? I think in our industry, you know, as far as um, housing and buildings and things like that, um, you know, there's one thing that I really see a big change coming. And I think that's gonna be in more uh, factory built housing, you know, uh, as compared to the old days, right? Where a subdivision is built and, and individually houses are framed with the all the sticks of lumber and, you know, and then they're wrapped and they're insulated and they're covered and all that sort of stuff. Well, you know, in the factory built housing, the, conditions are so much tighter 
on on you know their their ability to build and to put these uh, structures together. And so we have one right now, actually, that's, um, you know, it's in the process of, of getting approved. It's going to be an apartment complex, uh, multiple buildings, three-story and four-story. And uh, supposedly, you know, the, each of the apartments is going to be built at a factory and literally comes out on the back of the truck. And then, you know, the whole cube which is essentially done inside, the cube is picked up and they're all stacked together and then they get assembled into a building. Well, you know, I think when you look at that kind of building, um, you know, in our, in our house, it's going to be so much better, you know, well sealed, well insulated, you know, uh, just better conditions all in all. And I think that's what we're going to see a real difference in, the construction of building and houses in particular and how they're put together and then how they're able to resist the elements on the outside so that we can be comfortable on the inside you know um, now conversely there's a there's another side to that subject and that that other side that you know just to plant the seed of thought is about what they call indoor air quality and, and that's become a real issue. And that's a big part of why you've seen the articles lately about the gas stoves and what the gas stoves put out and, and the health problems that are surrounded with that. Well, you know, I've always had this notion that, look, if you're putting in a gas stove, you got to have an exhaust to it and it's got to be ducted outside the building. And yet there's many, many people that would fight that tooth and nail, you know. And so out of the articles about the gas stoves, one, one guy answered it by saying, hey, yeah, you, ventilate, you know, ventilate, ventilate, ventilate. That's what you need to do. Um, but all that comes down to indoor air quality. And, and again, uh, I think what we're going to see is fresh air drawn into the house, but it's going to be tempered through heat recovery exchangers. And, and then the house, uh, you know, the warmth in the house itself and where we get that heat from, um, you know, alternative means of heating, right? Radiant heating systems, um, you know, the, the mini splits uh, as compared to a ducted, you know, forced air kind of scenario. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but I, I think that's the biggest change that we're going to see in our lifetime, you know, over the next five years, 10 years, and, and even 15 years is more manufactured homes um but not you know not trailer parks you know mm -hmm. they're, they're going to be nice homes mm -hmm. uh, and and they're just they're assembled and built under tighter conditions so <clears throat> they come out with a much better quality oh well, that's great to hear because as a as a civil engineer myself i've i've often thought this um so i'll just wrap up by telling you you didn't see the the, the whole document that we had tonight but there's almost a whole page on education, um, incentives, and, and the other things you're talking about convincing people. We're totally, I think, totally on board with your sentiment there about um, we're not trying to force people. We're trying to convince people as, as efficiently or as, yeah, as effectively as we can. Yeah. That's how, how do they define a, a, a leader as a, isn't that somebody who convinces people to do the things that we want them to do? <laughs> uh, Brian, I was happy to hear you say what you said about uh, factory uh, built uh, housing because my oldest son designs those. Wonderful. He's an architect. I'm done, Meg. Richard? So, um... Brian, I, I'm also uh, welcome and glad that you uh, were able to attend. Uh, someday we'll meet in person. Um, but yeah, we, we ended up having, a, as John said, a, quite a close relationship with uh, Greg before um, in developing the reach code. And, and we felt really good about that relationship. And I think that you are bringing the same, um, the same sentiment to the table, which is good. Now, the thing is, is Brian or uh, Greg was a 
uh, vegan. Are you ready to take that step? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think I'll go there. But, you know, I, I, I too really appreciate the opportunity to meet with you guys and just talk. And, you know, and I will close just by saying that um, actually Greg and I have known each other for the longest time that uh, and, and I really admire him. He has been a really dynamic force in our industry. He and I worked together some 30 years ago when we were both just little juniors, you know, at, at another city. And so it was really funny, you know, to, to kind of, uh, you know, to know him, to have a relationship with him all these years. And then, uh, you know, I kept watching Davis and I thought to myself, God, what a great town that would be to work at. And and I also said to myself, I I'll bet he's never going to retire. He's never going to leave, you know. And and so when the opportunity came up, I just jumped on it. And I'm thrilled to be here. I, you know, I really do like this community and I admire the the goals and objectives, you know, that our leadership has. And uh, it's just great to be able to put my own energy into that and see it become real. So pleasure to meet you all. I'm glad to be here. And, and I hope we can meet in person one of these days real soon. Oh, welcome. I'm glad, look forward to talking with you more. All righty. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you so much for spending your evening with us today. And we look forward to hearing more exciting developments in the REACH code as they move forward. All righty. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Gary. Okay, once again, we have a community member who has raised a hand, but we've completed public input on this item, I believe. Did we do public input? Mm hmm Okay. Um, okay, so if you want to move on, we can go to 60 or... Oh, sorry, were there any final comments? From Michelle, did you want to add anything? I'm not sure if I unmuted. No, now you're unmuted. Okay, yeah, no, I'm good, thank you. Okay, thank you. If I, if I can, Meg, I'll just mm -hmm. close by saying if there's anybody out there that has further questions or later on thinks of something um, you know you can contact me right down at uh, city of davis at the building department to my emails on the website my phone number's there uh, come on in we can have a cup of coffee anything you need all right we appreciate that thank you very much all right thank you guys thanks okay yeah so i think with that we can move on to the subcommittee reports And I guess maybe with this, I'll open for public comment before we, well. Before you forget. Yeah, before I forget. <laughs> the, only, um, the only item that had any attachments was the Environmental Recognition Award. So mm -hmm. public commenters may not have anything to comment on unless you give your reports but okay so we'll open it again at the end um so i'm just going to go through the list i know that the eras is that we have the most to talk about um but first up is the cool parking lots slash parking lot shade two by two with tree commission update is there any updates from that there is not it continues to be um on hold um pretty much until the end of the urban uh forest management plan update which i guess is about now i'm sure jacob's going to tell us so no yeah, no I, news i imagine that it's been a there's been a lot to talk about with the regarding the urban forest in the past few weeks okay sounds good um environmental justice kira and michelle do you guys have 
any updates on putting anything together for to so we can further our own understanding of environmental justice? Um, I've put together some points, um, but Michelle and I have not yet had an opportunity to meet and kind of go over how we want to present it. So I will say don't have anything this month, but stay tuned. Okay, awesome. Well, I appreciate you putting something together and we'll look forward to that for maybe for the next meeting. Um, yeah, for transportation, demand management, Jacob and I also have not gotten together about that. And that's also my bad. I've been traveling a lot for work and research related things. Um, and it's been a chaotic time. So hopefully we'll have some more materials for that maybe at the next meeting. Jacob, do you have any thoughts that you want to add about transportation demand management? Just highlighting that um, the transportation demand management was also mentioned in um, the city council discussion of the cap mm -hmm. as well. Um, I'm not sure if that means that that staff are going to be doing any, or if it would be like the consultant that are going to be providing any more information or any costs related to that. Um, uh, Carrie, I'm not sure if that's like something that you all have discussed or if that was just sort of general direction and, and um, action isn't necessarily being focused there. Um, the only information that's in the cap right now is what's in the document and the um, implementation roadmaps. And I believe that what council was saying was they want more information about that. And I think that that would be a staff and project management team approach. However, having said that, Anything that the commission wants to add is value added, um, but I don't think that you guys were necessarily making recommendations. There was talk at one point of having a sort of a, um, a collaboration with the BICIC, the BTSSC, um, but what you're talking about now is more um, information sharing for the commission. So that might morph into something more but it's not really your responsibility um, that would be on staff with being advised by whatever you might have to add. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. I think that clarifies like, um, yeah, we can still, uh, and, and I think speaks to the fact that we wouldn't be duplicating efforts um, if uh, staff and, and the project management team are going to be focused maybe on different different parts of that transportation demand management plan within the cap and then uh, Meg and I would be focusing more on transportation demand management uh, more broadly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's talk about the Environmental Recognition Awards 2023. Um, it's the time of year again to establish a subcommittee to review the nominations and make recommendations about who to bestow awards on. John, go ahead. Since this is a, a substantive, uh, could we finish up the other subcommittee reports? Because they're gonna be short and get them out of the way and then come back to this big one. Sure. Okay, we will come back to that. Um, fireworks. Uh, that is no longer on the agenda. Right, okay. The, just so you know, it was on the long range calendar, but um, when we talked in our agenda setting meeting about putting fireworks on the agenda, um, we received word from the city clerk that that's on the city council agenda for January 31st. So it would not make sense for the commission to talk about it um, in advance of the city council meeting, so. Okay. Um, monitoring subcommittees, anything from air quality? Uh, energy, Richard, do you have anything that we haven't talked about already? No, I, I already sent around. Uh, the news items cover everything that I could probably think of. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, my updates related to energy, I guess, is just that there is a lot going on in California on the battery supply chain, as well as nationally, and a lot of federal and um, statewide attention being paid to that. So 
if you're interested in talking about that more, then let me know because it's all I think about all the time. Um, toxics and waste. Uh, nothing to report, but there's an awful lot of uh, stuff on the uh, uh, being distributed now on plastic uh, pollution, and uh, it's something that I'll look into some more and mm -hmm. share. Okay, awesome. Yeah, kind of circling back to Richard's comment at the beginning about Davis and how we're what level of plastic we're accepting here and water. Uh, just like Tom said, there's a lot of talk about how. Uh, um, uh, PFAS are going to be the the next uh, real challenge. Um, to add to that, the e EPA just released new guidance about PFAS and PFOA, so you can. I don't have a link to share, but if you Google search it, you will probably find the updated EPA guidance. Cool. Great. And then, John, did you have anything from Unitrans? Unitrans missed this last two meetings, but we got reports from the um, uh, manager and just have three quickies. Uh, one is that we're conti they're continuing to uh, retrofit um, the uh, um, the natural gas buses into near zero emission technology. Um, that project is mostly done. It's all funded, but it's not quite done yet because of supply chain. The electric buses are all ordered and are scheduled. So we've gotten six already. Uh, sorry, yeah, six already. Four are due next spring. Um, four, I think, are due next year. They've been delayed by that a little by supply chain a little bit as well. So those projects are moving forward. And finally, uh, they have launched a Zip Pass, which is a smartphone app by which you can pay your fare on Unitrans, uh, Yolo Bus, Causeway Connection, and RT. So you have one, one app to pay for all. I just used that to go to the airport last all right. week. Did it work? It did. <laughs> yeah, and I was able to like sprint to the bus stop with all of my stuff and then kind of stressfully get the ticket before the bus got there. So. <clears throat> Cool. <laughs> That's good. I wonder have they talked at all about making um I know in with Bart and then in DC and New York you can have that in your Apple in your wallet on your phone. Have they talked about at all about that or is it just kind of staying as its own app for now? They have not talked to us about that, so I don't know. Okay. Cool, because that it actually is remarkably convenient when it's all kind of in one place. Okay, well, those are both exciting developments. Um, and then how about the Tree Commission? Yeah, thank you. Um, the last, the uh, Tree Commission meeting scheduled for the, this month was canceled. I think the city's arborist was a little bit too busy um, with cleanup work. Um, but I believe that the last, I believe, I, I don't think I gave you all an update after the last meeting, which was in mid-December. Um, where they gave us a preview of the website that the urban forest management plan is going to be hosted on. Um, so to date, they've they've done a lot of the research as well as setting um, goals and policies, and then they're starting to transition some of the data that they have onto that website. Um, it's I think it's going to be a great hub for information. Really going to um, increase the accessibility of that information to the public and to probably other city staff. So for instance, there's um, other than uh, like setting it, uh, they'll have the plans, priorities, and policies on there, but it'll also have things like interactive information pages, um, and the kind of, you'll be able to track the latest um, census data, uh, like tree census data that they're doing. They have a word for that, but I can't quite recall it, but you'll be able to just switch between maps of like census track income versus vegetation type versus heat island effect and you'll be able to kind of navigate all of those um, any member of the public will be able to do that critically for our purposes too you can also um there's there will be a 
some sort of tools that will help with um, determining street canopy. I think that's going to be a layer specifically of street canopy, and you can really see what areas of the city are well covered and which are not. You know, you can imagine it's just like a difference between like maybe Second Street out by Target versus like, uh, you know, the um, uh, some of the he more heavily um, tree parts of downtown or something just really stark it should help planning process and it should help a lot of what we've talked about with the active transportation um planting and making sure that those like bike lanes uh pedestrian infrastructure is shaded um so really exciting things to come and um i'll see uh when we can get back uh um, yeah i'm sure the next meeting will have a lot of updates for us all that's awesome that's really exciting well do you know if it will have bike lanes mapped out well. It it's superimposed onto um like satellite imagery, okay. but I'm not sure if it also illustrates bike lanes. Um so it's like if you zoomed in, you'd be able to see what's available on right. the street, but I that's yeah, not, there's not like a layer. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. I wouldn't say no, but I'm not totally sure. Okay, cool. Awesome. Okay, so I think. With that, we can go back to the Environmental Recognition Awards. And Kara, I think so you had your hand up for that earlier. Oh, I was just going to say that I am happy to be a part of it again, having done it last year, because um, I thought it was kind of fun Yay. getting to see all of the different potential nominees. Amazing. Thank you for starting that off. Um, and Jacob, were you, you had just joined the commission last time, but do you, do, do you need like a background on what the ERAs are or what that entails at all? Because I think the rest of us have seen a couple. Yeah. Um, I got up to speed last year when, during the awards process. So I, I think I'm, um, uh, I don't think I need any specific, specific background. Thank you though. Okay. Cool. And Carrie, did you have anything that you wanted to talk about with the environmental recognition awards i uh, know i just um i had all i prepared all of these materials last year so you got the schedule um a potential flyer to announce it a press release and the nomination form um which i would think might be discussed if necessary in the subcommittee but Hopefully all of those things are fine. I think we took the recommendations of the subcommittee last year. Mm -hmm. um, so the main action other than any discussion you might have is, um, is establishing the subcommittee. And I will note that I see that um, um, council member Partita has just joined us. So um, after this item, um, she may want to have a comment. So it's good to see you here. Fantastic. Welcome. And thank you for joining us, Councilmember Partida. Um, happy to be here. Sorry, I'm so late. I had a meeting before this that I thought was going to get out in time. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how it goes. But we're happy you're here. We're just talking about the Environmental Recognition Awards and making a subcommittee to work on those. Great. Great. Uh, John, go ahead. Carrie, I had one question about the materials that you sent out. Uh -huh. um, the, the flyer, um, the flyer correctly says that there's four different categories, but the public, uh, the, the nomination form only has three. Mm -hmm. And if I remember correctly, I think that the commission does, comes up with the legacy, um, but does the flyer then, I don't know, the, when I read the flyer, it kind of suggested that the public could nominate legacy. I, I guess I'm just looking for some clarification on, on how legacy is going to be handled. Um, we have not asked for um, public application or submittals for the legacy, but that has not stopped people from doing so and the reality is that there's been a bit of you know like assigning the correct category when the when the submittals are made so we have the subcommittee has moved things around a little bit 
sometimes people think that like an individual that's been involved for the last two years should have an environmental legacy award, which is not really what that is established to be. So you're right. The, the form shows that there are four categories. We are not asking for nominations related to the environmental legacy, and we don't even necessarily have to have an environmental legacy award every year. Um, so hopefully between the press release and the flyer, that information is fairly understandable to community members. <clears throat> but we don't stop people from submitting whatever nominations they see fit. And then we try to make sense of it all in the subcommittee and then finally in the full NRC. Okay. Okay. And then the is the reception for Tuesday, April 18th, is that just at the city council meeting or are we going to have another kind of separate celebration like we did last year? Um, historically, the um, presentation is at the city council meeting and the reception is immediately following the ceremonial presentation. And of course, with the pandemic, we were not able to have in-person meetings over the last couple of years, but now that city council meetings are in person, it will probably be immediately after this. So what has happened before is the presentations are done and then council takes like a 15 minute recess to 10 to 15 minutes to visit with the, the awardees goes back and the reception continues. The subcommittee and the NRC can choose to do an additional celebration should you choose to, um, more similar to what we did last year. But last year was kind of like, we didn't, as everyone knows, we didn't know how long we were gonna, we were going to be meeting remotely. At the beginning, people thought, oh, this will be a few days a week, you know, <laughs> um, and then it lasted for several years where we didn't have any in-person celebrations. So mm -hmm. that was a roundabout way of answering your question. At the very least, we would have the reception at the city council meeting and could choose to do another in-person one if the commission wanted to do that, but not necessary. Got it. Yeah, I mean, I guess because I only know the virtual only or what we did last year where it was a separate event and I thought for me I thought it was kind of nice to have an event that was focused on the people who had received awards and brought people together for that but I would leave that up to the subcommittee. So what we did during the pandemic years is we had I prepared a slideshow with visual images of each of the awardees and we invited those awardees as panelists. So they had a minute or two to accept the award. So it was still done with each individual being able to um, participate in some way. And then last year's event, and we really appreciated you being there, Gloria, was sort of more of a, a culmination of several years that we had not met in That's person. Right. But it wasn't that any of those awardees had not already been honored and had a chance to speak. That did happen virtually, just not in person. Got it. So before the pandemic, we would adjourn in that 10 minute spot that Carrie mentioned to the conference room outside of council chambers. And we'd have some little finger food and get, have a chance to, to mm -hmm. talk to people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right, well, go, circling back to the subcommittee, is there anybody else who would like to volunteer to be on the subcommittee? I think that my recommendation would be that there would be at least two members, so you might need to draw straws or. Um, yeah, I was just going to wait in an uncomfortable silence until <laughs> someone couldn't handle it anymore. <laughs> Sorry, that was me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I've been on the NRC for a very long time and never served in that committee. So I suppose it's my turn. All right. With such enthusiasm. <laughs> All right, let me turn around. I'm really excited to uh, to work with my fellow my fellow co-member uh, person or my fellow committee person. Commissioner. Commissioner, thank you. It's late. Okay. Fantastic. So uh, thank you. Thank you both. We appreciate it. Um, does anybody else want to speak now to have the chance to participate in this wholesome community building event? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Could you remind me again of the due date? Um, let's see, it looks like the submissions are due, what was it, March 15th? Let me pull it up again. The nominations are due March 15th. And then I guess, so I guess we would determine the who we're awarding during our March meeting, Carrie, is that right? Yeah, it's on the schedule there. So the following, sometime during the following week, there would be a meeting of the subcommittee which has in the past typically taken an hour, maybe in an hour and a half. And then um, staff, meaning me, puts together the recommendations and sends it to the full commission meeting, which is at the end of March. And then the next steps are, it gets approved on consent by city council in the beginning of April. And then the actual presentation and ceremony is closest to Earth Day, which in this case is April, 18th. So um, I think that's the April 4th is the approval and April 18th is the, if I've got the dates right, um, the presentation. So mm -hmm. outside of the commission meeting, the time commitment is maybe an hour to review the submittals and an hour to meet, and that's it. So it's during the last two weeks of March. Mm -hmm. What's that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will also volunteer to be on the subcommittee. <laughs> Great. Okay. Do we need to make a motion to establish the subcommittee with myself, John, and Kira? That's probably cleanest. Okay. Would anyone like to make that motion? I'll make that motion. And I'll second. John? Aye. Richard? Aye. Tom? Aye. Jacob? Aye. Kira? Aye. Michelle? Aye. And I am an aye as well. <clears throat> Oops, I advanced. I hope that was okay. Yep, that's fine. All right. Any members of the public who would like to make public comment, please raise your hand. Okay, doesn't look like any comments. Um, yeah, and then I guess council member Partita, is there anything that you would like to to share or communicate with us since we have you here before we move on? Um, I don't have anything at this time. So, and like I said, I apologize for being late and sort of out of the loop. I was really hoping to uh, catch some of the, what was done earlier. So if you guys don't mind starting over, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up for it. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we you, missed, you missed some <laughs> lively discussions about building electrification, but I think they actually should be summarized pretty well in a in a memo that you can look forward to reading before your next council meeting. Okay, great. And I and I'll probably reach out to some folks because I I was like I said I was really hoping to to catch some of this meeting. Yeah, so thank absolutely. you. Yeah, we welcome that. And thank you. Okay, Carrie, do you have any comments on our long range calendar and upcoming meetings? Um, I don't have any. We um, 
We moved several items to the um, unscheduled. Um, I will I will note that um, everyone should put those dates for all of the meetings in their calendars. And this year, for some reason, for the first time, I did send out an Outlook invitation to everyone. So it should be held for you. Um, when I do the calendar for the year, I do check whether there's any upcoming um, known holidays and there don't seem to be any this year. So um, that fall on the fourth Wednesday. So it looks like we'll be able to meet on the regular fourth min mon fourth Monday every month, um, except that typically we don't meet in August. And of course, December is right around the holidays. So um, unless something comes up, um, those should be the dates. Cool. Sounds good. Did anybody want to make any comments about things they'd like to add or talk about for the long range calendar? Uh, yep, go ahead, John. So this is speculative because I didn't get a chance to listen to the city council the other night and maybe um, council member Partita can inform us. There was an item on the on the agenda about about forming a council subcommittee to look at criteria or conditions for approving um, developments between now and the time of the general plan being written. And we had for a long time talked about trying to put together a list of, of some guidance um, on things that were would be expected um, so that we didn't uh, from new developments from environmental and energy issues so that uh, people didn't have to kind of reinvent the wheel for every development. And I wondered if there was any place for that kind of discussion or input, or is that whole process going to be done quickly? I, I don't, like I said, I apologize. I'm, I missed, I missed your meeting, uh, Gloria. So um, I don't know what's happening with there or whether there's any any desire to have us help? So that's, uh, I think that that's a great idea because the the whole point is to have a little more certainty for the planning commission. So this came up in our, um, you know, in our joint session with the planning commission and they were, you know, just expressing a little bit of frustration because there is not uh, a general plan and they were feeling like you know these every every development that came forward was a you, know, you, you kind of had to like work out and um uh the parameters for everything and it was all feeling very piecemeal and so um the hope is that we have some sort of an interim um you know guidelines for for making decisions about um uh you know, developments, uh, especially the ones that are coming forward around the periphery, right? Uh, oh. And so I, you know, in, in putting together something like that, I think, you know, the, all the input that, that we can get would be very helpful. Could you tell us anything about the schedule? Um, it's, uh, we're hoping that it doesn't drag out Right, and so um, I'm thinking that it that we should have something put together by the end of the spring. So I guess the question is, would you want something kind of official NRC, <clears throat> or would you just like to have conversation with NRC, or would you just like to have NRC members write your letters with good ideas? So let me think about that. I haven't yet met with the other member of that subcommittee. Oh, you're uh, one of them. Okay. <laughs> I'm right. <laughs> yes. Um, wait a minute. Am I? I'm not really sure now. <laughs> I'll have to th I'll have to think about that. But isn't uh, that yes. you and um, Council Member uh, Vaitla, or am I wrong? I so see we just threw together all these all these uh, subcommittees, but I think that I I think it is, but it may be it may be Bapu and Will, mm. right? But I have my meeting. I have my meeting tomorrow, 
with the city manager and so I'll bring this up. All right. Any other comments or questions? Okay, do we have public comment on this item? No, we don't do public comment on this item. Great. And in that case, I think we can move along. I think the next item is to adjourn. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, we're about, what, 40? Under an hour uh, over over our scheduled time um so important things were done yeah i think yeah i think we had very good discussion today um yeah really appreciate the level of preparation that went into giving us all kind of something to talk about and a lot of details to get into about the electrification measures uh and looking forward to also talking about other aspects of natural resource management at our future meetings. Um, but great. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, all thank right. you all so much. Thanks, Meg. Thanks, all. Thank well, you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.